Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Are You in Control of Your Controlled Environment? Sponsored by Premier Tech. I'm Robin Sitberg of Meister Media Worldwide, publisher of Greenhouse Grower Magazine. In this webinar, we're going to talk about how to face new challenges in the greenhouse, because there always are some, and some actions you can take to plan for the unexpected. We'll have time for some questions and answers at the end of the webinar. So if at any time during the presentation you'd like to ask a question, type it in the question pane at the lower left panel of your screen and click Submit. You can do this at any time during the webinar and we'll answer questions at the end. But before we begin, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Troy Beekle is a horticulture specialist with Premier Tech Grower Services and he's been with the company for more than 25 years. He's committed to offering growers alternatives, new ideas, support and solutions that suit their ever-evolving requirements and needs. Troy's specialty is flowering plants, um, more precisely plant nutrition and water quality. He's written many articles for his company's newsletter, Grow in Media, as well as uh, several trade publications. Um, he's also given dozens of seminars at allied trade and distributor shows and made dozens of videos throughout the years presenting specificities and advantages of ProMix products. He also provides tools to solve different growing problems. He has both a bachelor's and master's degree in horticulture and helping clients have success with their growing media and with their crops is the biggest part of his job. So now I'm pleased to turn it over to Troy so he can share some of this knowledge with you all today. Take it away, Troy. All right. Well, thank you, Robin. I appreciate the introduction. Yeah, today we're going to talk about are you in control of your controlled greenhouse environment? It's kind of an interesting topic because uh, a lot of times um, you ask the question, are you really in control? One of the responses I would normally get when, let's say, an issue or a situation comes up, you know, sometimes with experience you might say something has the effect, I've been growing the same way for 20 years and nothing has changed except for, and you can insert growing media, fertilizer, pesticide, whatever it might be. And that is true. There may be some changes that have occurred there, but there are a lot of factors that are outside or sometimes within your control in the greenhouse growing environment. So experience is important and needed, but keep in mind the following. Ask yourself the question, when something changes or something's different, has the growing season changed from one year to the next? Are there any disease or insect pressures, or have they changed? Are they the same? Does your water change from year to year, which, of course, we'll find out is the case. Are you growing the same crops? Do you have a new caliber coat that's more sensitive to iron deficiency and showing problems that way? Are you using the same container sizes? Are there new employees that water differently that may introduce some additional challenges to the crop cycle? If there are changes that do occur, then really adjustments need to be made, so there's just more to it than one specific item. It could be a, a whole cacophony of many different things that could create a problem in the greenhouse. So there are variables within the grower's control. Of course, this is up to a point, but for instance, temperature. You can heat, you can cool, or you can open up the vents. Humidity, you can take high humidity out of the greenhouse through opening the vents, assuming the outdoor air is not too humid. Air movement is great for moving humidity around and helping drying out uh, your foliage and your media. Water application, you basically have control over how much goes on and how frequently pH movement within the growing media, keep in mind that pH change in growing media is caused both by your water alkalinity and also by your fertilizer, so those variables can be within control. Fertilization, how much you apply, how often you apply it, and of course plant spacing, because after all, plants are they are too close together, they don't branch very well, and they tend to shoot up so they get long and slender. Uh, that also controls uh, the quality of your crop as well. But there are variables that are outside your control. Oops, just jumped ahead here. And things such as weather. Is it sunny? Is it cloudy? We know that's a big variable. Insect and disease pressures, they can introduce crop problems. They can affect crop quality. And that can be quite variable from one year to the next. Your water quality can change over time, as we know. pH management and nutrient issues, we talked about that being within your control. But sometimes there are things that change that you're not aware of that suddenly become outside your control. Water management, do you have new people that are watering? Uh, are there things that change with your growing media that makes it more difficult to manage it? There's different times of the year and weather events that make that also difficult. Growing media itself, yes. Sometimes things happen with growing media. We'll talk about that. And last but not least, employee experience. Again, you can't control how your employees water or fertilize or how they grow the crops. You can try to 
impart as much knowledge into them, but sometimes they just still quite, you know, it's still a new learning process, so that can introduce challenges into the environment which you can't control. In this presentation, we're going to take the first six and go into them in more detail. Uh, the employee experience, I think that kind of speaks for itself, so I won't be going any more into that. So the first one we want to talk about is the weather. Now, as we know, weather patterns change every year. We, we see, uh, you know, spring from one year to the next is never the same. It's either hotter, colder, more sun, less sun, maybe you get more humid days, more rain, less rain. All those things change, and they introduce variables into your growing, uh, growing situation. You do have control over your temperature, but there are situations, for instance, if it's way too cold, so you're growing up in, let's say you're up in central Manitoba and it's minus 50, it's really difficult to keep a greenhouse at 60 degrees uh, Fahrenheit at night when it's minus 50 on the outside. On the flip side, if you're growing down south or maybe you're growing in the summer uh, in the northern part of the country when the temperature outside is in the 90s, it's very difficult to get the temperature below that in the greenhouse. So those are situations where temperature is hard to control. Humidity. So as an example, if you've got a lot of humidity outside because it's rainy or it's foggy or it's just really warm and just you have a high dew point, it's really difficult to reduce the humidity inside the greenhouse if the outdoor humidity is high. The problem with high humidity, it causes soft growth to develop. You get stretching between your nodes. You tend to run more into edema problems, especially in the cooler time year where you, your bottom cells rupture because they accumulate with so much water. And you see this brown tissue forming on the bottom of your leaves. You see this a lot in ivy geraniums. It also increases diseases, both you know, mostly foliar. Uh, it can also reduce the dry down rate of your growing media, so it's easier to overwater it, and it can increase other issues relating to overwatering. Uh, one thing I'll show you in the next slide, it also increases calcium and boron deficiency. And if you think about it, the nutrients that your plants uh, basically obtain from the growing media come in from the water that they basically drink from the growing media. If it's humid, the plants drink at a much slower rate, so nutrient uptake is slower. And because calcium and boron directly, in, directly work with brand new tissue forming. If they're deficient, they create problems. Now, of course, sunlight is, can be an issue, as we know. There are some controls you can have. So if you have supplemental lighting, you can turn on the lights in the winter months when your day length is too short. In the summer, if it's, the day length is too long, you can use something like shade cloth if you want to try to bring mums into earlier uh, flowering, for instance, or keep poinsettias on track. Uh, or you can also look at shade curtains to keep the heat down or even liquid shading if the temperature gets too high as a result of the sunlight. So this is an example of boron deficiency in the salvia on the left-hand side. Essentially, boron deficiency looks like somebody came in and took the growth tips and pinched them off. So as those growth tips are growing, if the boron's not there, they just simply die out, and you get a lot of side branches, and those tips on those side branches will also die out. To the right is calcium deficiency, and that is in strawberry. Notice the leaf tips are all brown, you know, crunchy tissue. Uh, that occurs because as that leaf, uh, those cells are expanding, there's not enough calcium there, the cell walls kind of fall apart and the cells die. Now the sunlight has a significant impact on plant growth. And I, again, I'm not saying anything that you probably don't already know. But just to give you an idea, if we look at this chart, uh, the vertical axis would basically be the, the, the plant growth rate, or basically the plant size, I should say. The goal is to hit that red line above, which is the plant size target. Across the bottom would be time. The green line would be your relative growth rate of your plant, where it's at in its cycle. And the yellow line is the, the peaks and valleys. Or the valleys would be representing cloudy days. The peaks would be representing sunny days. So the more... Uh, uh, you know, obviously on a sunny day, I don't have nights factored in here, so night is not in here, but if we look at just daylight, the amount of intensity of sunlight, we see that the more sun you have, and again, this is assuming you're growing in the north or really in the spring anywhere in the country, we see that we hit our target size faster in a sunnier uh, spring season than we do in a cloudier uh, spring season. Again, it has to do with the amount of sun. Why is the sun important? Well, the sun affects, obviously, the growth rate of the plant. So the number of sunny days directly impacts crop quality and performance because when you have a lot of sun, 
it increases photosynthesis. And when you have a lot of photosynthesis occurring, that produces photosynthates, which can be used to produce sugars, proteins, and used to uh, basically build plant structures. So the more sun you have, the more plant, you know, more plant you can actually build. So that's why your plants tend to grow faster when you get a lot of sun in the spring. It also affects crop timing. Now, if we have lack of sunlight, uh, we tend to see we have poor growth. Uh, we tend to see our growing media tends to dry out a little bit slower, so there's a lot more, there's a lot less oxygen in the growing media, so overall plant growth is slow. It's going to take longer to mature that crop. On the flip side, if we have lots of sunlight, we get faster growth, we get faster dry down of our growing media, and our crop will mature a little bit earlier. We also know that sunlight also heats up the greenhouse. So if it's cool or cold outside and you're in, a, in you know, maybe a short day situation, that actually will increase crop growth. However, if you're in the middle of summer or maybe you're down south, maybe late spring, uh, it can get too hot in a greenhouse. The sunlight can be too intense. It can actually go the opposite way where it can actually reduce growth. But in general, for most of us in the spring, more sun is better. So the next one or I want to look at is insect and disease pressures. So insect pressure, essentially I look at it this way. If you had an insect problem last year, there's a possibility you may have that same problem again this year. But there are some things you can do to mitigate that from happening. Consider where your insects would hang out. You want to remove all the weeds in the greenhouse. You want to take care of any debris that's fallen to the ground, whether it's foliar debris or maybe growing media or whatever debris there is. If you take and clean the greenhouse out, chances are the eggs associated with those insects may also be taken out too. So it may minimize the potential of a future insect problem coming from the greenhouse. So once you have everything cleaned up and you go into your next growing season, you want to quarantine incoming plants and inspect them. Look for insects. Um, you want to treat infested plants just in case they do come in with, with something on them. So it's best to treat them with either some kind of pesticide or maybe uh, or even with um, you know natural predators, especially when you get them out into the, into the actual greenhouse. Once you get the plants out in the greenhouse, transplant it up. You want to monitor, you know, scout those plants. You set out sticky cards to see, check for insect populations and look at your actual plants. If you see things such as distorted plant growth or leaf growth, honeydew, stippling on the upper surface of the leaves, flower size reduction, poor vigor, webbing, all of that seems will probably point to a possibility of an insect problem. So if you, as an example, you take and look under your leaves. That's where you usually see your white flies and your mites will be typically be in there. Look at the flowers. Oftentimes that's where your thrips are, are hiding. Look at your growth tips. You have your aphids that would be on there and your biggest growth or right to the growth tip on some crops you might see broad mites. Uh, look in the leaf axils and stems you might see your mealybugs. So the bottom line is if you do see this as, as a problem in your crop you might want to release some kind of biological or chemical control to try to reduce the insect population. Now, disease pressure, again, very similar to what I just said about the insect. Uh, again, there's always a certain amount of inoculum in the greenhouse at all times, whether it be Pythium, Fusarium, Rhizoctonia, whatever it might be. Uh, if, it were, if one of those was a significant problem in your last growing season, it could also transfer over to the new growing season where all the spores might be. If that is a problem, what should you do? Well, the best thing to do would be to take the plants that are diseased and get rid of them during a growth cycle. At the end of the plant cycle, remove the, any kind of weeds because there could be disease harbored on those. Remove your plant debris from your greenhouse, get rid of it, clean it up, and then sanitize all your surfaces so that if there's any uh, spores left over or any live inoculum, that essentially will kill it. And then once you get into your growing season, when your plugs or your liners come in, quarantine them, inspect them, and if necessary, treat them. Check out your plants, look at your foliage, look at the roots of the, of the plants, make sure there's no brown roots or, well, obviously with foliar disease, you're looking for spots or you're looking for um, like a powdery material, depending on what the disease actually is. So you wanna keep that in mind. But keep in mind too, sometimes you see spots on leaves, a little bit of damage, it could also be a shipping thing as well. It's not necessarily just disease, but you should verify it before you bring it to the greenhouse. Once you get ready to transplant and go into your uh, final pot size, 
You might want to consider using a growing media that has a biofungicide pre-incorporated into it if disease is a problem or if it's a crop sensitive to disease. Or if you don't have that, you can at least drench some type of biofungicide onto the growing media. Once you are in production, you want to try to avoid overwatering to prevent root disease from being a problem, and you want to try to encourage good airflow to dry your foliage so you don't uh, see as much with the foliar diseases. Water quality. So just so everyone's aware, and I think everyone is, your water quality does change over time. So we take a look at that. Uh, there are some things that, that take place. So your nutrient levels and your alkalinity will we'll tend to fluctuate. We do tend to see this happening more in shallow wells versus deeper wells, uh, just because with shallow wells are more subject to precipitation. Deep wells are to some degree too. What we find is if you have an excessive rain period, you know, spring and fall, or maybe you have a lot of flooding situations, you will tend to see your nutrients and your alkalinity dilute, so those numbers will go down. If it's during a drought, especially, you know, going into the end of the summer, you might see your nutrients and your alkalinity and your water start to concentrate or those numbers will go up. The problem is as these things fluctuate, that can introduce potential pH problems and possibly certain nutrient deficiencies or in some cases nutrient toxicities as well. And keep in mind if you do see this and you decide I'm going to drill a new well or I'm going to for the first time capture runoff water from my greenhouse or capture and recycle my water coming from the floors, Keep in mind that those water sources are all unique and very different, so you want to test all those sources as well as test your water annually anyway. Now, next couple of slides, this chart is kind of set up. So across the vertical axis will be the pH of the growing media. Across the bottom will be time, in this case weeks. And then the green kind of shaded area on the graph, that would be the normal range for that specific pH. Now, in this particular example, <clears throat> we're feeding a crop, if you want to say, with 21, 5, 20, and 150 parts per million. But in this scenario, we're going to change and have three different water alkalinities with the same fertilization regime. So if we take a look at this chart, we see at 75 parts per million alkalinity, which is kind of low to moderate, we see that constant feeding with 21, 5, 20, over time, the pH does start to drop, especially towards the end of the crop cycle meaning that 21,520 is a little too acidic for an alkalinity of 75. We also see an alkalinity of 150, that green line. It stays fairly stable throughout the entire production cycle, which means that 21,520 is pretty good matched for an alkalinity of 150. If your alkalinity is 225, then we see over time the pH does creep up and can become a little bit uh, too high towards the end of that crop cycle. So the bottom line is this. If your water alkalinity changes, let's say you are normally feeding with 21,520 and your water alkalinity is 150, and it changes to 225, which could happen, you can see that that 21,520 suddenly is not quite doing the same job with pH management. So you're going to see, like that upper uh, right-hand picture there of that petunia, you might see a little bit more yellowing in some of your crops. Again, nothing's changed with the media, nothing's changed with the sun, maybe just simply the water alkalinity changing can create that issue. Another example of water quality changes specifically with alkalinity, let's look at it from the other perspective. Now we fix the alkalinity of the water, it's 50, so it's fairly low, and then we look at three different fertilizer regimes. So let's say, for instance, your water alkalinity in your greenhouse is 50, and you use three fertilizers, we see 20, 10, 20 is too acidic, so over time, the pH drops to really low levels. 17,517 is more of a neutral, and it seems to work very well with an alkalinity of 50. And 13,213 is a little too alkaline, so over the course of the cycle, at the end it gets a little high. It's not unbearably high, but it is a little bit high. Now, if we change at alkalinity, let's say we drill a new well on the property, and now the alkalinity is 180, but we still use the same fertilizers, we get a totally different result. So 201020 suddenly works really well with an alkalinity of 180. If we're still using 17,517 as we were with the 50, but didn't change it for the 180 well, what ends up happening is our pH is going to go up over time, and you're going to run into uh, micronutrient deficiencies in a lot of your petunias and calibricoa. If you're using 13,213, this definitely will not work because it's too alkaline, and your pH is definitely going to go places you don't want it to.
So that's looking at how water quality and alkalinity changes can occur. Again, changes outside your control. The next one is nutrients. Now, nutrients, I'm talking about what's actually coming from the water itself. Those things can change over time. Uh, I do want to point out that a lot of fertilizers that are out, offered out there in the market do not provide much calcium, magnesium, and sulfate. Now, yes, there are CalMags that provide plenty, and that's not what I'm referring to here. But just keep in mind that a lot of them don't provide a lot. But there's a dependency then, therefore, that the water can supply these elements, and in some cases it does. We also got to look at our water for also undesirable elements such as sodium chloride, fluoride, or excessive micronutrients that, that could cause toxicities. Uh, we want to look at those numbers and make sure they're not at high levels to cause toxicity or high enough levels that maybe they're not toxic, but they could compete with other elements for plant uptake, in which case you'd have to up your rate of fertilizer or look at possibly reducing those, those uh, toxic, uh, I shouldn't say toxic, but those other elements. Test your water annually because you want to see if your nutrient levels are changing, and I'll show you an example here in just a moment. And also, if you have a new water source, you need to test that to make sure uh, there's not an issue with that. So in this graph, we're looking at magnesium. Um, the vertical axis is the parts per million magnesium in the growing media. <clears throat> Across the bottom is time in weeks. And we have three water sources with three different levels of magnesium. The assumption here is that the fertilizer is not providing any magnesium. So where does the magnesium go over time? We see that uh, minimally we'd like to see 25 parts per million between the water and the fertilizer. 40 is even better, 50 is nice as well, but 25 is kind of our minimal. So the, the green shaded area would be the ideal range uh, for that to be in the growing media. And we see... At 40 parts per million, you know, throughout the crop cycle, we see that magnesium might be accumulating a little bit. It depends on the crop. It could go down. It could go up. At 25, we see that it stays within the normal range. It does drop a little bit as time goes on, but it pretty much stays in that same range. But at 10 parts per million, we run to almost zero by we almost week three or three and a half into four. So the bottom line is <clears throat> if you're – water change from a 25 parts per million magnesium and all of a sudden now maybe you had a lot of rain or something changing the water now it's down to 10 parts per million magnesium you're going to see poinsettias if you even grow poinsettias like that in the picture we see with the lower sleeve showing yellow uh, tissue with green veins looks like iron deficiency except it's on the lower leaves so summary of the water quality changes number one test your water annually Match the fertilizer to the water quality. And keep in mind, if your water quality changes, your fertilizer program may also need to accommodate that and change as well. <clears throat> if your alkalinity is too high, then you would inject acid to reduce the alkalinity. Some target points, and it really depends on what you have for fertilizer, what you need to fertilize with. So plugs and cuttings, we usually look at 80 as kind of, you know, kind of an upper end. I mean, you can still go to 100, but still that's kind of a point where you start saying maybe I should look at acid. For general growing, maybe about 220 on the alkalinity, you might consider acid. I do know growers that have uh, alkalinities up around 300 and can keep things sort of at bay using more acidic fertilizers. Uh, if you do inject acid and you bring that alkalinity down, then make sure you match your fertilizer to the adjusted water alkalinity that you're working with. So pH and fertility management. So how are these outside your control? Well, believe it or not, sunlight changes things in your fertility program. So with sunny weather, we know we're watering more frequently because your mix is drying out faster. High water alkalinity, as we know, uh, water alkalinity, think of it as a measure of the limestone content in the water. The higher it is, it is the more lime there is in your water. So if you're watering more frequently, you're applying lime more frequently. And the more lime you apply, the faster the pH of your growing media has potential to climb. But the good news is your plants are also using or utilizing nutrients more rapidly from the growing media because they're growing faster. So as a result, they're, you're, you're watering more frequently if you're constant feeding. You're also feeding more frequently if you want to say in a specific period of time. Now, the good news is the plants can utilize the fertilizer to cause pH adjustment, which can offset the increasing pH coming from the water alkalinity. But the disadvantage of, of kind of a fast and furious growing environment 
is um, if a plant is utilizing the, the nutrients coming from the fertilizer, but maybe one or two are a little bit low for that specific plant, deficiencies may show up quicker because it's going through the, the nutrient cycle faster. The flip side of that, the cloudy weather, we do less watering. So we see that plants will utilize fewer nutrients. They don't, uh, they don't need as much fertilizer because they're not photosynthesizing as much. So your pH change tends to occur more slowly, both from the standpoint of alkalinity and from the standpoint of fertilizer usage. We do tend to see more calcium and boron deficiency because the plants are not utilizing the water as much. So remember, nutrients come when the plant roots are drinking the water from the growing media. That's when the nutrients come up. If anything slows that process of flow of nutrients into the plant roots, it can induce a deficiency more easily, even if the, the levels of calcium and boron in the growing media are normal. Now, if fertility rates are reduced, which I'm not a big fan of this, because, again, in cloudy weather, you're feeding less frequently, so you're really, over the course of a week, you're actually, the plants are actually seeing fewer nutrients, but if you do reduce the fertility rates, remember, you're not only reduce, reducing NPK, but you're also reducing micronutrients, and it's very possible micronutrient deficiencies show up more frequently in that situation, too. Next category, from sunlight to water, uh, we want to look at the categories of different water. So again, with pH and fertility management, we talked about how water affects your alkalinity, nutrient levels, but also changes how your pH moves in your growing media, which we kind of demonstrated that earlier. But just some foods, food for thought. Rainwater, for instance. Rainwater has no alkalinity, and it basically has no nutrients. So when you're collecting rainwater, you can essentially assume there's nothing in there, and you can kind of go with that. Pond and river water typically have low alkalinity. Not, it could be zero, but typically it's low, maybe 20, maybe 50, maybe 80 parts per million. All that would be a little bit high. Um, you have low plant nutrient values, so you can assume it's probably low in calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, and micronutrients. Your EC tends to be low, and the good news is your undesirable elements tend to be low. Now, with well water, that's where you see alkalinity levels becoming higher plant nutrient levels becoming higher. You could struggle with higher EC and possibly higher undesirable elements. A lot of it has to do with where you're at in the country, like down in the southwestern part of the country, we see a lot more problems with higher sodium levels. Uh, East Coast, especially close to the coast, we don't see a lot of uh, issues with alkalinity and nutrients. The water is more pure. In the central part of the country, we see very high alkalinity. So it just depends on where where you're from, what's in the soil or in the rock strata as the water travels through it. Now here's an example of how different water sources will affect basically the, the crop itself. So we have petunia here. It's, been, it's growing at 150 parts, well, it's being fertilized with 20, 10, 20, and 150 parts per million with three ounces of Epsom salts. The first water source is rainwater, which has zero uh, alkalinity. The middle one is from a shallow well with 120 parts per million alkalinity. And the last one's from a deep well with 315 parts per million alkalinity. And if we notice, with zero alkalinity, I wouldn't recommend 201020 for zero alkalinity, but this is a petunia, so it likes a lower pH anyway. It looks pretty good. Actually, it's the best of the three. The middle one, it's a little bit, maybe not quite as dark green, but it's still, there's no chlorosis. The plant looks great. Uh, I'm happy with it, and uh, actually 201020 matches up better with a uh, with a pH of or with a water alkalinity 120. And we take a look at the last one where the uh, alkalinity is 315. That's a little bit on the high side, and for 201020, that's why we see petunias with yellowing. So again, if we change our water source and we drill a new well or we capture runoff, please keep in mind that all water sources can potentially be different and have different results in the quality of your crop. Again, a variable that's maybe outside your control, but testing it can bring it back into your control. Now, if we take a look at the crop itself, uh, crops have specific requirements. But in general, I don't think it's very healthy to say, well, I'm going to feed this crop, this specific fertilizer at this rate, and this one a different fertilizer at this rate. No, pretty much if you take a look at a water analysis and match the fertilizer to the water analysis, you can pretty much use that as one um, fertility program for the entire greenhouse. Now, 
Yes, there are fringe crops. There are those that will tend to show problems if things go a little bit outside of normal range. So on the high end of the pH scale, crops that tend to show problems when the pH gets too high, we have them listed there. So your Bacopa, your Calibricoa, Diacea, Dianthus, Nemesia, Pansies, Petunia, Snapdragons, Verbena, and Vinca, and there are more. These crops will tend to show the new leaves will come out with a yellow uh, tissue with green veins. Uh, these crops tend to prefer a lower growing media pH, so 5.2 to 5.8, because they have a poor ability to be able to take up micronutrients. Because of that, you can use these as an indicator crop. If overall your pHs of your, of your uh, fertilizer program with water are running too high pH, these will show it. On the flip side, if overall your program is running a lower pH, then you look at your indicator crops such as geranium, lysianthus, marigolds, New Guinea impatiens, pentas. They prefer a growing media pH that's higher, 5.7 to 6.3, because they can acquire micronutrients too easily. In this case, you can see a micronutrient toxicity found on the lower leaves in which you get little speckles of brown on the, kind of on the leaf margin. Eventually, you get a thicker leaf margin that's brown and crispy, and that browning tissue will work its way in towards the center of the leaf, and eventually the leaves go up the stem showing the same pattern. Um, one thing I will mention, it's kind of not quite in the right place, but I threw it in there anyway, your fertilizer application rate has an impact on the pH of your growing media. So in general, uh, as long as it's not causing crop damage where it's too high, the higher your fertilizer application rate, the greater the pH change that will take place in your growing media. So if I feed at 100 constant and I decide to switch it up to 200 constant, you're, you have double the amount of fertilizer the plant's using. That means it's changing the pH more rapidly based on that fertilizer level, which could affect, obviously, your, your pH, your growing media as well. Water management. So essentially, we've seen this earlier, we know water has effects on crop growth. So for instance, if you keep your growing media too wet, you tend to see more stretching. You keep it on the dry side, you tend to see more compact growth. It affects root disease, shore flies, fungus gnats, all those tend to be more active in wet growing media versus dry. Plant height, we know that if we keep our growing media dry, our overall plant height will tend to stay more compact. And algae kind of runs with the uh, root disease and shore fly theory that algae tends to grow on a wet growing media surface. What I find interesting is, is, and I'm seeing this less than I used to, but oftentimes, especially in smaller operations, I see that the watering is relegated to the least experienced employee, uh, which is kind of a problem because watering, there's an old expression, he who holds the hose holds the profits. And I believe that to be very true because a lot of your uh, disease problems and crop quality issues can be affected directly by the amount of water the crop is receiving. So for an employee, if they're good at, at, and they want to do a good job, if you've hired them and their main job is the water, they're thinking, if I'm not watering, I'm not working. So they're going to tend to water a lot on a sunny day. That's great. On a cloudy day, not so good. So they may tend to overwater. Uh, I tend to find that more overwater than underwater. So here's some uh, examples of what happens when you overwater. Uh, both pictures, we see slime growing on top of the media. On the left-hand side of the vinca, that algae slime has thickened to the point where it's now black in color, so it always looks like the media is wet. On the right, it's still green because it's still relatively thin. But again, all that's growing because the surface of the media is not drying out. Another example would be these pansies. If you look real closely, you'll see little black dots on the leaves of those pansies. Those are shore flies, and shore flies thrive in wet growing media. So again, kind of symptoms of, if you're wondering, gee, am I keeping my crop low on the wet side? Those are symptoms you can look for. Now, with water management, ideally, you to try to minimize some problems that can occur, try to water in the morning, especially in the earlier part of the growing season, in the earlier part of spring or late winter, because that'll give the uh, leaves a chance to dry off so that they're less likely to go into the night wet, so that reduces some of your pathogens or some of your foliar diseases. It also helps to allow the media surface to dry a little bit before evening as well, which can help with uh, 
reducing algae growth and attractiveness to shore flies. On cloudy, cool days, as all of you know already, you do little to no watering because, quite frankly, the plants don't need it. They're not drying out, so therefore there's less of a need for it. That needs to be imparted to new employees so they understand that when it's cloudy and cool, watering uh, needs to be reduced on those days. Sunny days with good airflow, like uh, we start having this time of year, especially in the May and June. A hey, watering, you can still overwater a crop, but it's a lot less likely, but more watering would be required. So how do you teach somebody how to determine when to water? Um, in a peat-based mix, real simple, you can observe the, the basically the color of the growing media surface. It, it's a real good, uh, effective tool to determine when to water. Basically, as the surface lightens, it indicates it's drying out. You can use that as a way to indicate when to water. And I'll show you some pictures of that in just a moment. But mixes that have core blended in or wood fiber or bark, it's a little trickier. They, the surface tends to dry out a little faster than what's going on below. So what's going on on the surface is not necessarily, necessarily reflecting what's going on below as it is with a peat perlite based mix, for instance. But there are other things you can use. You can use container weight to determine is the mix wet, is it dry? You can stick your finger in the, in the growing media to see if it's wet down below. Or last option is to pull a pot off to look at the growing media. Everybody knows what if it's saturated, you'll, you'll see it. You know, it'll be dark or, or it'll be lighter color. Um, there you can use the color as a good indicator down in the pot regardless of uh, which components are actually in the mix. So this is what it looks like. Again, let's ignore the fact this is not perfect watering, okay? Um, on the left-hand side, we see impatience. This is before downy mildew became a problem. But what I want to point out is the, the containers around the perimeter uh, are a lighter brown color, and the ones in the center are kind of like a, almost a black color. Again, color is a great indicator. When it's black, it's wet, do not water. When it starts to dry out like it's doing around the perimeter, we're getting close to requiring watering. Uh, when we see it pull away from the sides of the container, we know we are definitely ready to water that growing media. We see that also in the uh, peppers in the slide or in the picture to the right. Again, the, the rows in the middle, we're actually seeing the mix actually pulling away from the side of the cell pack. And that would be a good indication, hey, it is, in fact, time to water. Growing media, yes, of course, coming from a growing media company, we'll talk about this. So most reputable companies make consistent growing media, okay? The performance of the growing media will vary based on the weather. You know, uh, I see this all the time. If you have a, a really difficult growing season in the spring, it creates more problems with the media. It's not necessarily because the media is bad. It's just that the weather is creating more issues. So watering can become a problem. Water chemistry can also create problems with pH going out of whack, those sort of things. There are some things that do happen to the growing media, which is the fault of time, and that is uh, there's three things that happen when the growing media ages. The first one is the starter fertilizer charge that most companies put in their mix will start to degrade over time. So when you start getting six, nine months out, you can assume that most of that starter fertilizer is probably on its way out. Uh, if fertilization is delayed, so let's say you are typically one, you bring your crop in, you plant it, and you wait three maybe two, three, four weeks to water in with fertilizer, you're just doing clear before that, what happens is your crop doesn't grow. In this picture, I'm sorry for it being a little bit small, but the packs on the left were started in a mix that was old. The ones on the right were started in a mix that was new. So old mix to the left, fresh mix to the right. And we can see that starter fertilizer charge made a huge difference in the growth rate of that plant. Keep in mind, everything was planted on the same day. Uh, to avoid that, just simply water in with fertilizer. And I will say, if you do have older mix, just simply assume that the fertilizer charge is not there. So if you have carryover from the previous year, if your mix is nine months old or older, just water in with fertilizer, and you'll probably avoid these types of problems we're seeing here. Second thing that can happen is degradation of the wetting agent. I don't think there's any grower out there who's not seen this problem before. Essentially, what that means is your growing media has a hard time absorbing water, and it causes basically a lot of inconsistencies, whether it's wetting up inconsistencies or uh, one cell absorbed some water, the next one next to it didn't absorb any water. So it can create kind of a mess. Simple to fix the problem, you apply a 600 part per million wetting agent solution. 
you might want to contact the company to verify the, the rate, but 600 is usually the rate that we look at with most of the reputable companies out there. And you might have to apply it a couple of times, but once that media is saturated with that wedding agent solution, you're good to go. Last thing that can happen is the pH of the growing mix can become high if the growing media gets wet. And we see this more in loose fill bags than we do in compressed bales because loose fill bags have breather holes punched into them. So if the water gets in there, it'll activate the lime. The lime will continue dissolving without any other inputs to change the pH. So sometimes your pH can rise above 6.2. I always recommend if you see that, uh, probably best use it for crops that actually can tolerate a higher pH, like geraniums, for instance. Now, if the growing media product that you use does not perform well, keep in mind uh, changing growing conditions can be a factor in that. It's not necessarily the mix, but it could be just maybe the time of year, for instance. Uh, general purpose growing media can be used year round, but they especially work well during the summer months when conditions are hot and are drier. Sure, some areas can have high humidity, which may slow the dry down rate of the growing media, but usually they work better in the summer months for sure. Uh, maybe during a cloudy, cooler time of year when sunlight's limited and things aren't growing the best, a high porosity mix would be a better product to use. There's also improper water management. As we know, uh, sometimes watering is tricky, uh, especially when you have new employees. Things can get overwatered very easily. But all my years working in the growing media industry, I've found that the success of the growing media rises and falls on the water management of the product. Uh, usually water and growing media go hand in hand. If watering is good, the media will perform nicely. If watering is, is challenging or inconsistent, then the growing media tends not to work quite as well. If on the outside chance the media is not working for you, you may therefore decide you need to use a different growing media. So if you do decide to do that, consider the following. First of all, consider adding active ingredients, which are basically biologicals. Uh, the reason why I'm suggesting that is it will help reduce a lot of problems that impact plant growth that may be outside your uh, knowledge or outside of your control. For instance, mycorrhizal fungi will enhance nutrient uptake uh, from the growing media and it'll help reduce plant stress. Or you can use biofungicides that help protect roots from pathogens, which often uh, are usually is a, is a great product of choice. So we couldn't get this video to work, but let me just describe at least what we see in the picture. On the bottom, we see all those little cells. Those are cells of a plant root. And that white line coming in on an angle is what we call a hyphae. That hyphae will grow towards the plant root because there's exudates coming off that plant root that attract that mycorrhizal fungi, causing the spore to germinate. It grows towards the root. And then what it does is it'll eventually burrow into the surface of the root, growing between the cells, and eventually set up inside one cell. And when it does that, essentially, well, let's, let's describe it this way. So those hyphae, that white line, they grow with the root system and they grow up past the root system beyond it to more efficiently mine out the growing media or the soil, bringing in water nutrients where the plant roots are not present and bringing it back to the plant. That, in turn, increases the total absorptive area of your root system. It improves the acquisition of nutrients and water because of that, it will delay the onset of nutrient deficiency symptoms. You won't see those show up quite as quickly. It doesn't mean they won't happen. It just means it won't happen as fast. It also will help reduce the effects of environmental stresses on the plants. So if we have stress from temperature, high salts, low salts, nutrient deficiencies, pH, all those things, the mycorrhizal fungi will help to buffer the effects of that on the plant. So it, where we see greater stress, we tend to see greater benefits with plants treated with mycorrhizal fungi. Now, the plant provides, um, that's a benefit to the plant, but the plant also receives benefit from, or the mycorrhizal fungi receives benefit from the plant. The plant actually feeds the mycorrhizal fungi. So I mentioned that that hyphae grows down between the cells and eventually sets up shop inside a cell. So water nutrients are coming into that cell from the outside through the mycorrhizal fungi, but that Mycorrhizal fungi will then absorb and take in through what a structure called an arbuscule. It'll take in the sugars, the photosynthates produced by the plant, and it'll help feed itself. Mycorrhizal fungi or endomycorrhizal fungi will benefit the crop or benefit the plant throughout the entire crop cycle. 
Now, biofungicide, these can be bacteria, actinomycetes, fungi that essentially feed from the sugars and the carbon exudates coming from the plant roots. Uh, not all are dissimilar from mycorrhizal fungi, except endomycorrhizal fungi grow inside the root. These tend to stay more on the, on the exterior of the root. So what they do is they will multiply around the root surface and they will occupy the root rhizosphere. And that will help to suppress root diseases through one, of the, through one or all three of the following uh, mechanisms. One, because the microorganisms are multiplying at such a high rate around the root rhizosphere, they serve as a physical barrier. It's difficult for a pathogen to get through that biological soup to get to the root system. Two, some of the biological organisms, the biofungicides, will actually produce antibiotics, just like a natural fungicide, that will make it further unattractive for a pathogen to go ahead and attack that plant root. And third, with some of the fungal biofungicides, they will physically attack the plant pathogen and kill it. Now, of course, the goal is if you have more protection for your root system, you do not need to use as many chemical fungicide drenches to protect the roots. You have that protection there now with the bioorganism. You would not necessarily need to, to apply all those drenches. If you have a healthier, stronger root system, you get better utilization of your fertilizer and water. You don't see the deficiencies as often, although that's not going to mitigate specific deficiencies, but root damage that would prevent uptake, and you get improved plant growth. So the bottom line is, with a biofungicide, it reduces plant loss, stimulates plant growth, and reduces grower costs from having to apply fungicides or other uh, maybe changing fertilizer programs, other things that would cause um, to correct problems that are seen. So this picture, um, it's not a live picture, but through the middle we see a plant root, and you see all those kind of darker dots all over the page. Those are actual bacteria, in this case Bacillus pumulus, that are feeding off the exudates coming off that root, and there's just a plethora of these bacteria growing all over the place. I try to get a flaviopsis or pythium through there, it's a little bit more difficult. Now, here's an interesting phenomenon that we've seen. Um, all the way over to the left, we have a root, and we got that pointed out there. There's this kind of this whitish ring around the perimeter of that root. That would be uh, the biofungicide bacteria that's growing on the root, and that we'd normally expect. It's feeding on the root exudates. But the rest of the slide, we see kind of a webbing structure. But notice some of those webs, which, by the way, that webbing structure is the mycorrhizal hyphae. We see that some of them are thickened or fattened, it's not that the hyphae is fattened, it's that there are actually bacteria growing on the outside of that root system. So they're actually feeding off of the exudates that come off of that mycorrhizal fungi. So again, like roots, hyphae of mycorrhizae, at least the gloma species we're aware of, does produce exudates that get leaked out into the growing media. So natural biological organisms or even some biofungicides will feed off of that, it's a food source, and they will grow around, form a strong association with the mycorrhizal fungi. If that bacteria, or actinomycete if that were the case, was a biofungicide, in this case in that picture was a bacillus pumulus, then you have a biofilm of, of uh, bacteria to help control root disease. It only forms on the root system of the plant, but also now is forming on the hyphae of the mycorrhizal fungi. So that means a greater percentage of the growing media is now colonized, shall we say, by this biofungicide bacterium, and that in turn will help to reduce the impact of any disease organism that comes strolling through there, so it further reduces your need for fungicide drenches and plant loss. But keep in mind, not all biofungicide bacteria or actinomycetes will colonize uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Some of them will actually be detrimental to mycorrhizal fungi, but in some cases there are a few strains that will actually work with it and actually colonize it. So here's some examples of, of why biologicals are really important to incorporate in your growing media. So in both pictures, we got salvia on the left, New Guinean patients on the right. I will tell you that fertilization probably wasn't ideal, but if we take a look, the, the trays on the left in both pictures do not have the biological additives added to it. The ones on the right have the biofungicide and the mycorrhizae combination. And we can see the plants are bigger. They're bigger because they're growing at their normal rate. The other ones are stunted and held back because the nutrients are a little bit lower. We don't see as much chlorosis, and we see overall more uniform, better growth. 
So when selecting a new growing media, if that's what you choose to do or need to do, keep in mind that you'll need to watch the watering because the watering will usually be different from one media to another. It may also require fertilizer adjustment, especially if there's wood products that are contained in the growing media. And generally for, you know, you may need a whole growing season to really get a feel for it, to kind of learn it and understand it. It may take another growing season. But in general, you know, keep in mind that switching to something will require some adjustments. Now, when you select a growing media, do it based on need, not on price. Yes, a less expensive growing media will save you money up front. But fortunately, we've seen this happen with customers where they do buy more inexpensive ones, and it does increase crop management problems down the road, increases watering difficulty, slow growth, et cetera, et cetera. Bottom line, you save the money up front, but you may end up uh, cause, causing more expense down the road. So with that, I am finished. Robin, we'll take it All back right. to you. Well, all right. Well, thank you, Troy. Um, we do have time for a few questions. Uh, he was very thorough, but that doesn't mean there aren't questions. So a few people have already submitted some, but I'd like to encourage you to go ahead and, and ask a question if you still like to. I'm going to start with some of our earlier ones. Uh, the first one is you mentioned endomycorrhizal fungi in your presentation. Are there other types of mycorrhizal fungi, and are they important for greenhouse crops? Good question. Um, yeah, there are different. There, there's basically two main groups. There's ectomycorrhizae and endomycorrhizae. Ectos uh, will colonize most of your trees and shrubs, so they're not really designed for greenhouse crops, where your endos will tend to colonize more of your greenhouse crops. So, yeah, there is a difference there, and I think that's important to uh, keep in mind. Okay. All right, our next question is about overwatering. Um, what is overwatering? Is it adding too much water at one time or watering too frequently or both? Yeah, so overwatering, when, when that's referred to, it's referred to not applying too much water at one time because your media only retains so much water. It's when you're watering too frequently. In other words, you don't allow the growing meat to media to dry out sufficiently between waterings and you water too soon and it'll end up just it just won't get enough oxygen and plants are more susceptible to stress and root disease and all that so yeah okay okay let's see our next question is let's see um grow mix with or without mycorrhizae for seedlings prep or for longer growing period i'm trying to figure out what they mean by that um, yeah, Let's I'm not see. sure. That's number yeah, eight one, there, if you're able to see. Grow mix yeah. with or without mycorrhizae for seedlings prep or for a longer growing period. I guess maybe they're asking, would you use mycorrhizae for a, a crop that you're going to have in a pot for a longer time as opposed yeah. to something that's going to be transplanted quickly? So with mycorrhizal fungi, I think where we're going here, um, Mycorrhizal fungi will colonize in the seedling stage, uh, and it, it then can transfer up into the transplant stage. So if you can get that mycorrhizal fungi on in the seedling stage, it will transfer through. Um, so just keep in mind, too, with, with a lot of the plug trays, you need to have a higher concentration because you've got such a small volume of, of a root system there that you need to apply it um, just to make sure you've got enough on there. Okay. All right. Our, no, let's see. Oh, I just clicked right out of our questions here. I know one of the questions was about the phosphorus levels of on the effect of phosphorus levels on mycorrhizae. Uh, is there an effect if there's too much phosphorus? Is it damaging? Yeah. No, that, that's a good question. Yes, phosphorus uh, with mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, what we find when the phosphorus levels are higher. It tends to make the roots less leaky and more difficult to penetrate through the fungus. Um, so phosphorus levels, we usually try to look at 20 parts per million pure P, or you know, to, that's kind of your maximum. But once the plant is already colonized, we see that you can go up to 30 and 40 parts per million pure P um, before it will become detrimental. Uh, what we do see is that a lot of fertilizers used in the market today, because the phosphorus has come down, Generally, we don't see that phosphorus has been too much of a problem for uh, for most crop cycles. But yes, you can 
you do want to keep your phosphorus lower, especially in the initial colonization stage. Okay. All right. Our next viewer would like to have you talk about organic wedding agents versus synthetic wedding agents. Uh, what are the performance differences on those? Okay. Well, that's a good question. So with wedding agents, um, uh, chemical wetting agents tend to be more stable because they have synthetic stabilizers in them. Uh, so they tend to work better initially and they tend to last longer you know, for the, for the long-term life of the product. We do have organic mixes, so we have that as comparison. With the organics, think of it this way. If you look at your biology and your growing media, uh, an organic wetting agent is kind of like candy to microorganisms. They tend to consume it faster, so we got a shorter shelf life on organic wetting agent. Plus, it's not quite as good as the synthetic because it doesn't have the stabilizers incorporated into it. If it did have the stabilizers, it wouldn't be organic anymore. <laughs> okay. All right, here's another question about um, micronutrients. You mentioned that calcium, magnesium, and sulfate are not found in high levels in most fertilizers. How many parts per million do you need of each element uh, for plants? And I know that depends on the crop, I'm sure, but... To some degree, yeah. Basically, with those three elements, yeah, there there are some crop specific issues, but in general, you want to see the combination of both water and fertilizer because both can be supplying elements. Calcium, there should be a minimum of 40 parts per million, but some crops like poinsettias and and uh, possibly even mums, they might want to see 80 or higher. Uh, with magnesium, 25 is kind of the minimum. Um, Looking at the maximum on magnesium, it depends on your ratio to calcium. But you know, 50, 60 parts per million would be maximum on the calcium. I mean, on the magnesium and calcium. Uh, usually, once you get 100, 120, that's kind of your max point. With sulfur, since it's usually expressed as sulfate, I will answer it as sulfate. Uh, sulfate should be a minimum of 75 in in your water fertilizer solution, and I've seen it as high as five, six hundred parts per million and not cause any problems. Not that we recommend it being that high, but usually if you're between 70 and, and or 75 and 200 is a good range. Okay. All right, we have time for one last question here. It's from a tropical plant wholesale warehouse in Los Angeles, and the plants are already mature, and they're looking uh, to convert to ebb and flow watering trays and would like to know what your thoughts on bottom watering are. Okay. Well, or is that something watering, you'd rather take offline? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I can probably address that. So bottom watering, uh, bottom watering is kind of nice because you can certainly, everything gets uniformly watered, which is nice because you don't have to worry about dry pockets and wet pockets as much. Uh, with bottom watering, again, you want to use a media that will wick well, so something that doesn't have a lot of chunky aggregates in there would be good to avoid. Um, when you're looking to wick water up, keep in mind one thing. Water evaporates from the surface only. And the problem with that is if you water, you know, if you keep watering, salts will start to accumulate at very high rates in the growing media surface. Once that plant comes outside your control going to a homeowner and they water for the first time from the top, those salts can migrate down through the growing media and actually damage your roots. So you just want to watch that, maybe take the... Um, the watering from the top, and you might want to make sure that you water from the top cage just to mitigate the possibility of high salt levels on the top surface of the growing media. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for answering all those questions. And we do have to wrap up right now. And I know several of you have not gotten your questions answered because we didn't have time. And Troy or someone from uh, Premier will certainly be able to follow up with you. We We have your email. And we can follow up and make sure you get your questions answered. Um, I also want to let you know you can watch this webinar on demand. So you can watch it at any time for the next six months. It will be available at the same link that you use to register today or to log on today. Um, and you'll also get a reminder email tomorrow with the link since you logged on today. So um, you'll get a couple of different chances to rewatch if you'd like to do that. Uh, so thanks again to Troy, certainly, and also to Premier, Premier Tech for web making this webinar possible. And we really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you.